Buenas noches, good evening. Welcome to UCSD Guest Book. I'm Jorge Mariscal. Our guest tonight is the acclaimed author, Victor Villaseñor, whose best-selling Reign of Gold is one of the uh, most important novels in Mexican-American or American literature in the last 15 years. Bienvenidos, Maestro Villaseñor. Thank Gracias. You. Thank you for Glad being be here. here. Um, let me begin by asking you to talk a little bit about your personal family history here in North San Diego County. I know your family goes way back uh, in this er region, and maybe you could tell us something about that. Well, my, my father comes from Los Altos de Jalisco, uh, that's near Guadalajara, and he came to the Texas border when he was about 11 years old, about 1915, and migrated to then to California. And my, my mother came shortly after the revolution, 1920. So uh, when I was born, I was born in the barrio of Carlsbad. And a barrio means neighborhood. And there were chickens next door and goats and pigs and the streets were dirt. And on the American side, the gringo side, there was paved streets with sidewalks. We didn't have any of that. And growing up in the barrio was, was a lot of fun. I could, my father had the pool hall and you could smell the beer in the alley. and and, and I lived mostly with my grandmother next door. So uh, I learned a lot of stories growing up and stories about my mother growing up in La Lluvia de Oro, the rain of gold in Chihuahua. And then my father told me stories about Jalisco and, and how he had a pet bull named Chivo and how these giants with great big tongues would chew on bones and then the revolution came. So I grew up knowing all about the Mexican revolution and in Mexico, and then, and then to kind of confuse me, my father had fun, he told me all of Carlsbad was Jalisco and Mexico, and Oceanside was the United States, and, and so I had all these facts all confused, and, and then I started kindergarten, and uh, I didn't speak any, hardly any English whatsoever, and then at that time they said, English? only and, and when we spoke Spanish they'd hit us on the head and and uh, within a few weeks of school I knew something was wrong and uh, I tell this to people and they can't imagine Mexicans that come from Mexico at the age of 10, 12, 15 can't imagine what it is for a five-year-old to be terrified the first day of school. I uh, within a week of the American system I hated my parents thought they were liars began to be terrified of school and and uh, and uh, I quit school in, in, the, in high school in my junior year went to Mexico found my roots with this rich Mexican culture and came back with a rage that I had been fooled as Muhammad Ali broke the dope and I had mm -hmm. and and why did this happen then I realized that it wasn't the American people because half or most of my friends were American kids in the neighborhood. So it was the system that had manipulated us to, 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 to think less of ourselves. And, and when I came back with this rage, that's when I decided to become a writer. Right, now let's talk a little bit about when you became a writer and, and why you did. Uh, obviously your family history is what motivates most of your texts that you've written. Um, can you tell us about when you started to write? Uh, I, I understand that there was a man down here in La Jolla who actually helped you to become a writer. And also, could you tell us a little bit about who your literary influences were? What authors were important to you? Well, first of all, for me to, to get that, yeah, one thing is very important to understand. I'm dyslexic. Right now, if you gave me something to read, even my own book, I'd have trouble reading it. And, and in the mornings, I can read Spanish. By afternoon, it, it starts getting jumbled and I get a headache, just like the memory right now is causing me to, to, to get a little headache right now. Mm. So, see, I flunked the great third grade twice. And I could memorize the words. And, and after, about the third grade, I began to be a secret agent. I would manipulate chairs. I would go to the restroom so I wouldn't be called upon. And my whole thing at school was to disappear during reading. So I'm not your typical person that becomes a writer. 
And in high school, something happened. I was always put in mentally slow classes. But in high school, some kids started playing chess, and I couldn't learn. But once I learned how to play chess, and I got it going, I became the chess champion of the whole school, plus the teachers. Mm. There was this one teacher, he was an old military guy. He was from West Point, and he thought he was a brilliant chess player. And I said, he said, I understand you're good. I want you to stay after school and play with me. And I said, sir, I'm sorry, I don't have time to beat you. And he got real mad. He said, what makes you think I, you can beat me? I said, well, I've seen you play. You're not very good. Well, he got so mad, he kept me after school. He said, I'll drive you home personally. I beat him five times in a row, flat out fast. And he got so mad that he said, you're not a stupid Mexican. You're a lazy Mexican. And I said, thank you. It was like the first time in my life I wasn't called stupid. I was called lazy instead. So with that understanding how hard dyslexia was for me, I was in Mexico and I met this woman from La Jolla. She was an American woman that liked Mexicans, you know, born again uh, Mexican type mm -hmm. Anglo woman. And she's the one that introduced me to books. And she got me to read this book that was all a picture book about humanity, family of man. And when I looked at that book, I realized we're all one race. We're all one family all over the earth. Then I realized that I had been fooled by education, that, that I was less than, than, a, than a normal human. And then she introduced me to a book of Homer's. And when I finished, she read it to me and I'd read it and I'd circle all the words I didn't know. And once that happened, I said, oh my God, books, good books are holy. They can change our life. Education's wonderful. It, 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 a book can become our best friend. We can take it to bed, to the bathroom, anywhere. And once I understood that, even though I was dyslexic, I would strain to read, and, I, and, and it would, I could only read about five minutes, and then I'd get a splitting headache. So I had to write down the words that I didn't know on that page over and over, about five times. And I started building a vocabulary, memorizing it, because I can't read them, see, I can only memorize them. And I didn't know that if you press down real hard, your hand remembers them better than the brain. Did you know that? It's, 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 a, it's a neural thing that happens. And over about a five year, I learned to read and I started reading books and I, f and, and I started understanding more and I kept trying to write but I'd write little short stories and I couldn't write very well. And then I saw this advertisement of, about advanced writers if they want to become a professional writer to, to see the University of California here at, and it was an extension course and Mr. Kaiser from La Jolla. So I'd already been writing three, four years, so I took all my writing and put it in the trunk of my car to come down and see him because I figured that that way I could impress on him that I'm serious about writing. So a lot of these people had already been published and some were newspaper people that wrote newspapers wanted to become novelists. And he asked me, well, what do you have? And I said, I brought 60 pounds of writing. They're in the trunk of my car and the whole class started laughing and, and then he said, well, I'd like to see that at break time. So he went and showed it to me. And I said, how many pounds do you want? And he said, no, no, just give me a couple of ounces. <laughs> so I gave him a little short story that I wrote about my experience in Mexico. And it astonished me because he commented on everybody's writing the next time we came the next Thursday night. It was a night class. But he didn't say anything about mine. So I said, oh my god, I'm going to get kicked out. So he said he wanted to see me afterwards. And afterwards, Mr. Kaiser was the first person that had faith in me. He said, I didn't want to comment about your book writing because it's so raw that it needs a lot of work. But he said, I can teach anyone how to write, but I can't teach anybody to have the passion and the guts to be truthful. He said, you're like a baseball player that can throw a ball 100 miles an hour or faster 
Well, you have no control. He said you're hitting people in the audience. Mm. You're hitting people all over the place. You, you have no idea of focus or point of view. You, you know, I never heard of the thing point of view. Mm. And uh, he said, I could teach you those. So he never commented about my writing in public, but he would take me home to La Jolla after he had talked to me from about 10 at night after class till 2 in the morning. About how old were you now? I'm about 24. 24. Mm -hmm. I'd been writing about three years. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe I'm 22, 23. I'd been writing for about two or three years. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and he taught me how to read. He taught me how to read Steinbeck and, and see how an opening works, how the first paragraph works. And I never knew that the first paragraph, how it worked, it has a point of view, and you stay focused to that. Then the first, then the second paragraph follows that paragraph. And then he started to break it down and, and it would show us how to actually break down a book and read it. Mm -hmm. And then how to use those tools. And then he'd say it's like walking into a house. You don't just walk in the back door. You walk in the front door, and it's open and clean to invite you in. Then maybe you have a hallway, or maybe you walk into the living room. And then he'd give us examples. The same thing, you have to invite a person into your book, or they're going to turn on the TV or the radio. A commercial writer has to invite you in. And then he'd have us watch TV without the sound off, so we can watch visually how a TV program works. And he'd have us read newspapers to learn how a good newspaper writer, he said, are very good writers. And, 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 he, and little by little, I gained respect for the whole commercial world of newspapers, magazines, TV. And, and, and I learned my craft. And uh, I kept sending books out, and, 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 and then I went in the army overseas and I came back and I kept writing and I wrote for 10 years with his assist help and I wrote about eight books, 65 short stories, three, four plays and received 265 rejections even with his help before I sold my first book called Macho and it was compared to the best of John Steinbeck by the LA Times. Right. Now, you know, you have been very successful, and I know you've written several things. I think what we'd like to talk about now is, is the new book a little bit. But, but first, I wanted to mention that, you know, there's a great example in Spanish literature of Cervantes, who spent 10 years between the first part of Don Quixote and the second part. <laughs> and you now have uh, spent 10 years writing the sequel to Reign of Gold. And I wanted to ask you what happened during those 10 years. What have you been doing? Uh, in preparation for the publication of 13 Senses? That, that's a very profound question. See, when I wrote Reign of Gold, I still didn't know what I was doing. I, I, I was assembling all my father's and mother's stories. And, and then when my mother would tell me stories that were too fantastic, like a, an angel appeared on the rock and told Rosa, it's not your husband that saved the Indian girl, the Yaki Indian girl that became my grandmother. It's the Indian girl that saved his immortal soul from damnation because he had been killing women and children. And, and, and then I'd say, Mama, an angel appeared? She said, yes, the angel appeared on a rock. That's what my mother told me. So I, like, how do I write that? And my mother said, well, write it the way I just told it to you. And I said, okay, Mama. So I wrote so many things that my father and mother told me that were miraculous and I had no comprehension how it happened. I just had to write it because it was their story and they told me, like my father said, when they escaped from the penitentiary in Arizona when he was 13 years old, he stole copper ore to feed his family, six dollars worth, and he's 13 years old and they put in the He said the Yakis ran across the Turkey Flats and the dogs and the, and the, the, the hound dogs and, and the guys on horseback, the guards, were after him, and, the, and they would say, piedra, piedra, and they'd sit down among the rock. And the dogs couldn't find him, and the guards couldn't see them. And I said, is it because it was dark? He said, no, it wasn't that dark. Well, the dogs can smell you. Well, they, they, he said, they pissed on me once, but they didn't smell me. And I said, well, Papa, how is that possible? He said, I don't know. The Yaki said it, I did it with them, and we escaped. 
so, so many things were so miraculous and rain a goal. And I didn't know how to do it again. I had to have more understanding. And then it seems like God is always with us if we're open. Because there are no accidents. So I'm in Tennessee. And this Navajo Indian approaches me. He says, you know, Raina Gold, you did it the Navajo way. And he explains to me about time being circular. There are no nouns. There are only verbs. And, and, he, and, 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 and you don't believe in God. You do God. You walk in beauty until you find harmony. Once you're in harmony, then you find peace. And I said, there are no nouns? He said, I said, what's a tree? He said, it's a tree. And it's changing in the morning, in the evening. Everything is always changing. I said, well, that's what Einstein said. And then he gave me, he said, you did all this in Reign of Gold. Didn't you know you did it? And I said, I guess I didn't. So what happened after I wrote Reign of Gold? I had to find out how these things happened. And I had a vision, one in Portland, Oregon, for World Peace, which is a celebration. Then I had another vision outside of Phoenix, Arizona, where the stars started waltzing and singing. And then I said, oh my God, if everything is a verb and there are no nouns and time is circular, then creation didn't happen. It's happening. It's happening right now. It's still happening. This is still the Garden of Eden. And an explosion happened. And an energy source came into me. And I spent two years without hardly any sleep writing 120 hours a week. And I wrote a book called God is a Verb and All is Well. And it's a thousand pages. It has no nouns in it. It's all verbs. And then I wrote another book. And then finally I understood that those books will never be published, that I had to write all those books just to take my mind to prepare to write the sequel of Reign of Gold. And then when I started this book, I understood that we have 13 senses that have come from Oaxaca, not five. And that's why my grandmother and my father and mother were and their families were able to perform miracles. And that's why milagros in Mexico are commonplace among the indigenous people. And that's what drove the Spaniards and the European mentality crazy. And the seven cities of gold exist. I've been there. And all these miracles started happening to me. And then finally, I was able to write the sequel to, to Reign of Gold. So what happened? I had to go through a whole break down and rebuild and every cell of my being change to go to the second volume from Reign of Gold to 13 Senses, which is the, the continuation story of Reign of Gold. But it isn't just that. It, 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 it's a book that's going to break all the boundaries we know about science and religion and everything. Now, in Reign of Gold, when I teach excerpts of that novel to my students here at UCSD, um, they're very interested in your construction of female characters. I'm thinking especially of Lupe um, in Reign of Gold, and I understand Lupe reappears here as an older character in 13 Senses. Can you talk to us a little bit about your understanding of, of women characters in your novels and how you, th how you think through that kind of persona? Well, it, I was told since a child my father told me that when the revolution tore their family apart, my father was the 19th child. 14 kids lived to adulthood. Three years into the Mexican Revolution, there were only three kids left. All the rest were slaughtered and killed. He said that his father, that was blue-eyed, red-headed Spaniard, started drinking. They said, God has forsaken us. And he died. But his mother, with the same reality as short Indian woman, said, tomorrow's otro milagro de Dios, another miracle of God. Y con esa fe, with that faith, she said, I got three kids left to live for. And she came down from Los Altos de Jalisco to the Valley of Guanajuato, migrated to Texas. And my father told me the strength of our species comes from the female, not the male. That any fight, any man who raises fighting cocks or fighting bulls always looks for the female. 
and, and the chicken and the cow because from there you'll get a bloodline of great fighting bulls and fighting cocks that if you breed to a dominant male within three generations you end up with a turkeys with they don't have the brains for survival they're big strong but they don't have their instincts are gone so I was told always that the strength of our species is from the female and my mother said the same thing her mother is the one that helped them survive the Mexican Revolution. So I grew up knowing from both of my parents that women are the power and that for me to be a success, I always have to be connected with and married to the most powerful, cunning woman I can find. So, so it, it, it's not so much my point of view, it's the point of view I've been educated with and I've found it to be true over and over and over again. Now, it, all of your novels have something to do with historical events, and Cervantes and all the great authors have really tried to understand the relationship between literature and history. And I think in your writing, it's very hard to separate the two. Um, could you say a few words about your conception of what that relationship is? In other words, how does history turn into literature? And does literature then turn into historical events? Well, probably my two favorite authors in the world are Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. They have such passion. And I'd have to throw in Homer and Cervantes too. And Tolstoy said that events make a man. That, that men don't make history. That, you know, Napoleon or whatever wouldn't have become who he is and the, the events are what caused him. Same thing with Hitler, same thing with anybody. Same thing with my own life. If I hadn't been beaten up and beaten down by the system, I wouldn't have gotten the rage. By the way, rage and anger are good. I tell everybody, keep their rage. Don't, when people say, you, you've lost your temper. No, I haven't lost it, I got it right here. It gives you the energy to accomplish things. Too much rage, then you go crazy, but enough. So I think that for us to show a character, we have to root them in history because their history of personally and their history of the society around is what makes them who they are and who they aren't. So to me, it, 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 they overlap completely history and, 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 and good uh, written books, whether you call them fiction or not fiction. They're still rooted in their time. The, the, some of the things that Hemingway wrote in his time are an embarrassment now, uh, uh, the positions he takes. But at his time, they, they made sense. Or, or Scott Fitzgerald, when you go around tipping waiters and dumping their liquor on the floor, I mean, they, they were spoiled brats. But they made sense for the Roaring Twenties. So my writing that comes from Mexico at the turn of the century and goes into the next century is rooted in the biggest change of the history the world has ever seen. We're going from the donkey and the, and the mule to the jets and, and computers and everything. So I feel so fortunate to be born with this very, let's say, primitive area of Mexico and, and the place where we are now and that I'm going to have characters that's going to show an involvement in this whole history and how history formed them and they form history. Now, Reign of Gold was translated into Spanish as Juve del Oro. Uh, how, how has the response been from Spanish-speaking countries? Uh, <clears throat> I can't say for countries, I can say for individuals. Uh, people love Reign of Gold in Spanish. And, and, and I have thousands of letters in Spanish and English that it's people's favorite book. Now, Spain took out their own edition, and they didn't want to call it Reign of Gold because they say that's, that's a, a slang for something that homosexuals do or something, and, and they took, they wanted, their translation is not very good. They, Spain's a little frightened and uptight, so, and they called it, I don't know, the wild something. But if you want to read the Spanish, the one that's translated, Reign of Gold, Lluvia de Oro, is a great translation, and, and people that have read them both like the Spanish, of course, better, because it, 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 that's, es el idioma que estaba usando cuando hice todo el trabajo para escribir el libro. That's 
That's the language I used when I was doing all my research. Right, and that's the language that many of the characters are actually all, speaking. Are speaking, yeah. Right. So something, a little something is lost in translation, but not much because I, I was doing it. Right. Now, we have only a few minutes left. I wondered if you could tell our audience about your project for world peace and the event that you have every year around Thanksgiving time. You mentioned to me just uh, before we went on the air that if you were to be incredibly wealthy, you would give about 90% of the money to uh, projects for world peace. And yeah, and live, reverse it, live on 10%. Right. And, and not incredibly wealthy, if I was just doing well. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> what it is, is every year, the Sunday before Thanksgiving at our house in Oceanside, which is where 78 and 5 meet, we're one block west, one block west and six blocks north right there on Stewart Street. Everyone's invited, and we normally get two to 3,000 people. It's a potluck that's made with loving hands for 12 people. You bring your kids and your family and your grandparents, y todos están invitados, and, and, and we have music and we have storytelling for the kids. And for one day a year, no complaining, no politics, no sports, we meet people, we shake hands, and we say why we're grateful. I'm grateful because of this, or I'm grateful because I had a good ball movement, whatever. And when you see people giving thanks, the energy rises up, and people go, they, they say it's one of the wonderful, it's so simple to be grateful. Is a, is, 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 I'm grateful every day that I wake up. That's what my father would say every day. Da gracias a Dios que esperté. And, and so a day of giving thanks is what I see that 5,000 years from now the United States is going to be remembered for. Not for all its commerce and all the wars and everything, but we had a day of thanksgiving with the pilgrims and the Indians when the Indians gave the first welfare line to the pilgrims. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be remembered for the country that took this simple thing and gave a day of thanks to the world. Well, Maestro Villaseñor, muchas gracias, gracias por visitarnos, amigo. for being here tonight. And thank you for joining us on UCSD Guestbook. And good evening. Buenas tardes.